to see each of you here. If I could have your attention, please. Uh, good evening and welcome to this time. This is a very special service uh, in the life of our church. I think it's only the third service that we've had like this. Uh, we had a service like this when uh, Ben and back then, Lai Chow, joined as elders. And then a couple years after that when uh, Pastor Brad and Pastor Mike uh, were installed to the office as well. Uh, and this evening in this service, we've dedicated this time to the public commissioning of Jeffrey Rex Blackburn for the work of pastoral ministry. Uh, it is also an occasion to publicly thank and bless God together for his provision of another elder to serve among us. Uh, it has been customary in church history for churches to mark the occasion when new leaders are appointed to serve in office. Uh, this is an ancient practice that goes back to the earliest days of the church when leaders were recognized and set apart for their work in the public context of the church's gathering. And we have the joy, the privilege of continuing in that tradition tonight. The office of elder is the main leadership office in the church. The office of elder is established by God himself. And the office is given, and the men who fill the office are given, as God's provision for the ordinary care, oversight, and leadership of the flock. Only men who are called of God, qualified according to the Bible, and recognized by the church may fill this office. We have gathered tonight to recognize Rex as one of our elders, one of the men to fill this office. And in this service, there are two main things happening. There is the public commissioning of Rex for this work. Uh, he will be commissioned. He will be set apart. He will be dedicated to this office as certain texts are read as the word is preached, as he takes his vows publicly before us, and as the elders lay their hands on him, symbolizing the approval of God, and the leadership of this church, and the congregation of this church for him to serve in this office. And you here are all to be witnesses to this commissioning and this installation of Rex as one of our pastors. Uh, but I want to remind you, this is also a service of worship. Uh, this is a service in which we celebrate the kindness of God in his care for our church in particular. We should see in Rex's installation the blessing of God on this congregation. One of the indications that God's spirit is with his people is in his provision of pastors to serve the church body. And in installing Rex tonight and recognizing him as one of the pastors of this church, we are recognizing nothing other than the activity of God's spirit himself. And a great sign that he is indeed with us in blessing this congregation. So without further comment, I'd like to pray and bless God, and then we'll sing a song of thanksgiving. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we come to this evening with great joy and with thankfulness to you uh, for your many kindnesses to this congregation. Uh, in just seven years together, you have poured out blessing upon blessing. We recognize how unworthy we are of your mercies toward us, your kind providences toward us. You have been pleased to preserve this church body, to grow this church body, to give to this church body qualified elders and deacons. Lord, tonight we come in thanksgiving. We come in recognition of your goodness and your kindness. We come in recognition of unmerited favor that we've received as a congregation. Father, thank you for being with us. We would even tonight I do as they did in those old days to raise our Ebenezer, that stone of remembrance, which says, thus far, God has been with us. Father, you have been with us. Would you please continue with us? And may you do that in and through the ministry of our brother Rex. Bless this evening to the great glory of your own dear son and for the good of our church, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing now in thanks to God. of love. 
God, whom heaven and earth adore, for thus it was, is now, and shall be evermore. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to read two passages from Scripture taken from Paul's letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Rex, I think it's helpful for you as I read these to consider um, these instructions from an older man to a younger man as he was admonishing this younger man in his work as a pastor to shepherd the people of God. Um, as I read these for the edification of the whole church, I ask that you especially take these to heart. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have which was given you by the prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, devote yourself to them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Uh, flipping over into chapter six, verse 11. Pursue righteousness godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Uh, children here tonight, I want you to imagine that uh, on a Sunday morning that I get up as I normally do uh, to the pulpit right before I preach, and I say to you, now, now the ministry of the word this morning, and then I, I say your name, the whole sermon is going to be directed to you, and, and just to you this morning. Uh, you might imagine how you would feel if that's how I began the Sunday morning sermon. It's a little bit of how Pastor Rex feels tonight, okay? Uh, this sermon is directed to Rex Blackburn. And it is customary when men have been installed in the office of pastor for the message to be directed in a special way to that man who is entering the office. Uh, but even, Rex, as I direct my message tonight to you, I deliberately want our congregation to hear what I have to say to you. I want them to be witnesses to the things that I say to you. I want my fellow elders to be witnesses to the things that I say to you. I want other men in our congregation who aspire to the office of pastor to hear the things that I have to say to you tonight. So this message is for all of us, though especially for Rex. Rex, there are four things I want to speak to you about. I want to speak to you about the origin of your call, the nature of your task, the resources for your aid, and the reward for your labors. I'd like to speak first at the origin of your call. Rex, the origin of your call is found in an ancient promise which God made to his people Israel perhaps in the darkest period of their history. Uh, the promise is found in Jeremiah in at least two places, uh, first in Jeremiah 3.15 and then again in Jeremiah 23.4. Uh, 
the promise God gives them is that in the new covenant age, or the new covenant spoken of in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, that in the new covenant age, God would give his new covenant people shepherds after his own heart. Uh, this is the language of the promise given in Jeremiah 3.15. I invite you all to turn there now. If you would turn to Jeremiah chapter 3. In Jeremiah 3, the main issue in view is Israel's high-handed rebellion against God. Uh, God calls his covenant people faithless Israel and faithless children. Uh, he uses very strong language, accusing them even of playing the whore. And God's people, they've been adulterous, they've been idolatrous, they have sinned grievously against God and appear now to be without hope. But God, even in the midst of their rebellion, promises them hope. He promises them a new covenant. And in this new covenant, he will write his law on their hearts, and they will all know the Lord from the least of them to the greatest, and God will forgive their sins and remember their lawless deeds no more. And as part of this new covenant, God makes an additional promise. God promises to give his people shepherds. Look at chapter 3, verse 15, if you would. The Lord says to the prophet Jeremiah, I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Appreciate the setting. The people of Israel have been adulterous. They had been wicked. They had been blind. They had been lawless. They had been like sheep without a shepherd. And God, in that context, looks on them in pity, and he says, I'm going to change this situation. I'm going to make a new future for my people. Of course, the most significant way he will change this situation is in giving them a new covenant and in sending his son to die in their place. But one of the things he will also do, we're told, is he will send them shepherds who will care for them. They, the shepherds, will be God's provision for his people. And these shepherds, after God's own heart, they will be like the Lord. That's what it means to be a shepherd after God's own heart. The heart of the man himself will be like the heart of God, and God will see to it that it is so. They will be like the Lord, and they will lead in the fear of the Lord. And what will be their work according to this text? What will the shepherds do? They will feed the sheep. They will bring the flock of God to the knowledge of God himself and to an understanding of his will and his ways. The other text in Jeremiah that speaks to this new covenant provision of shepherds is found in Jeremiah 23, 4. Uh, there in Jeremiah 23, you can turn there or not. In Jeremiah 23, the context there is not now just the failure of God's people, Israel. In the context of Jeremiah 23, the context is the failure of their present shepherds. Those who are currently leading them and shepherding them. Chapter 23 begins with these words in verse 1. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. And we have a more extensive and striking account of the failure of the false shepherds of Israel in Ezekiel 34, which was written around the same time as Jeremiah 23. The account there of the wicked shepherds of Israel is thick with treachery and abuse and wickedness. These are wicked men who failed to lead and care for God's people as they ought to have done. And now again, appreciate it. It's not just Israel's adultery that's in view. Not just their rebellion as his people. But now the focus is on the false shepherds of Israel who have failed those who ought to have been their shepherds have failed them. And there in Ezekiel 34, after pronouncing judgment over the false shepherds, the Lord declares, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. God is going to intervene. God himself will shepherd his people. He says something of the same thing in Jeremiah 23, verse 3. If you're looking at Jeremiah 23, verse 3, he says, Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. God says, I'm going to intervene. I'm going to change the situation. I will care for my people as they have not been cared for by the false shepherds. And how will he do this? What instrument will he use? 
to shepherd his flock, to care for his sheep. We're told in verse 4, I will set shepherds over them who will care for them. And they shall fear no more nor be dismayed. Neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. And of course, in the new covenant, this is exactly what Christ does for his people. This is what he does for his churches. Uh, We learn in Ephesians 4 that he, the risen Christ, gives to his church the shepherd teachers. The ascended Christ is risen and he's giving gifts to men. And he gives them for the provision of his flock. He gives them for the provision and the upbuilding of his church. He gives them to his congregation. Uh, Friends, all of us here, we should recognize that good pastors, true pastors, faithful pastors are part of the means by which Christ himself shepherds us. How is it Christ will care for his people? One of the ways he does it is by giving us good pastors. He will give them shepherds who will feed them on knowledge and understanding. This is the way Christ himself will bring his own shepherding ministry to his people. And Rex, the wonder of that thought should never be lost on you. Christ is determined to shepherd the flock in this church. And he has purposed to do it precisely through men like you. He has purposed to use you as an instrument to bring his heart and his shepherding care to the flock here at Emmanuel Church. And you should be freshly resolved, Rex, to truly be a man after God's own heart. To be a shepherd who will represent the heart of God to his people. A shepherd who will feed his flock truly on knowledge and understanding. God, Rex, is pleased to use you to fulfill this purpose in the lives of these people. He has brought you to this office and to this work in fulfillment of his word. You come now to this office tonight in fulfillment of an ancient promise of God. 2,500 years ago, God promised through the prophet Jeremiah that he would raise up true-hearted shepherds. And Rex, you stepping into this office tonight formally, is God's fulfillment of that promise. He is giving to us, his new covenant people, true-hearted shepherds who will feed his people on knowledge and understanding, who will be men after God's own heart. Rex, that should fill you with wonder. That should fill you with a sense of privilege. Uh, You are God's provision for his flock. This is the origin of your call. God's commitment, God's promise that in this new covenant age, he would give faithful shepherds to his people. I want to speak to you secondly, Rex. It's the origin of your call. I want to speak to you secondly about the nature of your task. Simply put, your task is to lead and care for the Lord's flock called Emmanuel Church of Winston-Salem. That's your task to lead and care for the Lord's flock called Emmanuel Church. You are to shepherd the souls of the people of God here in this congregation. You shepherd their souls by ministering the word to them in preaching and teaching. You shepherd them by praying regularly, even daily, for their souls. You shepherd them by counseling them and caring for them in personal ways. And you shepherd them by governing this church alongside your fellow elders in ways that make for the spiritual blessing and flourishing of this congregation. Providing this kind of leadership and care for the flock, you are imitating the earliest elders and leaders of the New Testament church. In Jerusalem, the very first church, the church's leaders were determined to give themselves, Acts 6 tells us, to the ministry of the word and to prayer on behalf of the flock. The Ephesian elders were told in Acts 20 verse 28, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Uh, Peter would later tell the elders of the churches in Asia Minor, 1 Peter 5, shepherd the flock of God who is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge but being examples to the flock. Or actually, the Apostle Paul himself would say in Colossians 1.28, he labored to present each one mature in Christ. You enter this office in the tradition of men who have gone before you to lead and care for the flock of God. And Rex, your eye is to be ever toward the flock here. You are in this for them. For their good and for their growth. For their sanctification. Rex, the needs of their souls should consume you. 
their well-being, their nurture, their growth and their faith, their hope, their obedience, their love, these things should ever be on your mind and heart. And Rex, the great object of all your ministry here in this church, as long as you're a pastor here, should be the salvation of these people. That is the great object of your work among us. Paul urged Timothy, we heard it in the passage that Pastor Ben read in 1 Timothy 4, 16, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching, persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Paul said of himself in 2 Timothy 2, 10, therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. As you're to think, as a faithful pastor, I am ready to spend and be spent if Emmanuel would only be saved. If these precious souls under my care would be saved, that is my heart's desire, and for that goal, for that end, I labor. In my study here at the church where I sit at my desk, uh, there is behind me uh, two portraits. Uh, one is a painting, one is a, a, a sketch. And the painting is of a man named Bill Hughes. He was one of my pastors as a boy, a British preacher. Some of you know Bill Hughes. He's come here before. He's still a dear friend. He's living today. He lives in England. And in Pastor Hughes' study, when he was in the ministry, he's retired. I think it was in his study. He had written above the doors, he'd be walking out of his study, five words. Those words were for him and for them. He wanted to be reminded every time he stepped out of his study, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? I am in this for him and for them. Rex, never forget that you are in this for Christ's sake and for the sake of his flock. Your ministry is not about self-promotion. It's not about creating some kind of platform for yourself. It's not about the exhibition of gifts. It is about the glory of God and the salvation of the flock. And Rex, your life from here on out is to be devoted to the salvation of these people. You must commit yourself to their care, to help the weak, to minister to the discouraged and the downcast, to call back those who are straying, to rebuke the haughty, to admonish the idle, to exhort, to encourage, to invite, to entreat, to love, to sacrifice, to minister, all for him and for them. Rex, to do this work faithfully, you must give yourself to it with unusual diligence, resolution, and focus. The nature of your task, the work of the ministry itself, will require of you active exertion, spiritual discipline, and hard work. It is not for nothing that Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 3, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Rex, your work is not the light and leisurely work of some. It is the work of the diligent soldier, of the disciplined athlete, and of the hardworking farmer. We may not be slouches and sluggards in Christ's service. We must be hardworking men. Rex, you enter this ministry like Brad Kinnison and me as younger men. How old was Timothy when Paul wrote to him? Some scholars think he was around 30 years old. Uh, Rex, you're a little bit older than that, but not much older than that. Paul's words to Timothy about his youth should have special relevance to you as they do to me. How many times, Rex, have we looked at this passage together, the passage that Pastor Ben read in 1 Timothy 4? I give it to you again now on the day of your installation, trusting that you have learned the lessons of this text and are resolved to follow it. Paul tells Timothy, let no one despise you for your youth. And as I've said to you and I've said to other men in our congregation, notable what he does not say. Don't let anyone despise you for your youth. And if they do, well, just show them your papers. Show them your MDiv. Uh, tell them that Paul sent you. That's not what he says. How are you going to mitigate against this flock despising your youth? He says, set the believers an example. 
in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Paul says to Timothy again, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Rex, this is the nature of your task to shepherd and lead the flock of God in this church. And Rex, for this work, you will one day give an account to God. Hebrews 13, 17 tells us, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Rex, as sure as I am standing before you this evening, uh, I do believe that in our flesh, you and I and Pastor Ben and Pastor Brad and Pastor Mike will one day stand before the risen Christ and we will give an account for how we cared for the souls under our charge. Rex, that should fill you with a sense of gravity, a sense of sobriety, a sense of the importance of this work to care for the flock of God. And may God help you, Rex, and help us to minister in such a way now so that we'll have no cause to be ashamed then when we stand before our master. I want to talk to you thirdly and more briefly about the resources for your aid. The origin of your call, the nature of your task, thirdly, the resources for your aid. Rex, as you consider these first two points, you may be thinking, as many ministers before you have thought, who is sufficient for these things? And that is, I think, only an appropriate response to the gravity of this office. And so I want to remind you of some of the resources for your aid in this work. You have access to certain resources of help and su of support in your ministry, and you will need them. You will need them because the ministry is full of dangers and difficulties, and it is full of discouragements. It's full of many dangers and difficulties. The scriptures give us reason to believe that the church's leaders are the special target of Satan's attacks. Rex, by virtue of stepping into this office, there is a target on your back in a way that there wasn't. If Satan would wish to ruin this church, this flock, he would target the church's shepherds, target the church's leaders. It is dangerous and difficult also because pastors are uniquely vulnerable to criticism, to opposition, to slander, to abuse, and to loneliness. They are also uniquely vulnerable to pride and to conceit, to a sense of self-importance, to vanity, and to authoritarianism. You will encounter these and other dangers and difficulties in your ministry. Pastors are also uniquely vulnerable to discouragement. Pastors often see disappointing and discouraging things take place in the lives of God's people. They see what most of the members of the church will never see. They carry with them always the burdens and sorrows and trials of God's people. Behind the scenes, they will see Satan score victories. They will see the evil of sin play itself out in the lives of the Lord's people in ways that are deeply discouraging. They will see people fall away. They will see division and strife in the church. But of course, Rex, none of these discouragements will be greater than this discovery of your own manifold weaknesses and failings and sins. You will often feel like a poor pastor and a disappointing Christian. Incompetent and unworthy for your work. For all these reasons and more, you will need resources for your aid, weapons for your warfare, and bless God, there are many. So many more than I can mention now, I briefly mentioned three. Rex, you have, first of all, your calling itself. Your calling itself is meant to be a resource for you, to persevere in the ministry. It is to be a source of security for you. Here's why. Because, Rex, I believe you did not call yourself into this office. You have been called by the work of God's Spirit, by the counsel of the elders, and by the flock of God here in Emmanuel Church. You did not press yourself into this office, but were rather called into it. And if God has truly called you to this great work, Rex, will he not supply you with a great store of grace to help you and to keep you in it? 
Paul himself often began his letters by a statement of his calling. He would say, Paul, called to be an apostle by the commandment of Christ or by the will of God. He opens his letter to the Galatians with this, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. I think in truth, Rex, you can say that about your office as a pastor. I wasn't called of God, chief, or called to this office chiefly by men or through men. I was called of God himself. Timothy, we believe, was prone to discouragement. He was timid by temperament. It's remarkable to me how many times Paul encouraged him by reminding him of his calling. By reminding him of the charge that had been entrusted to his stewardship. By reminding him of the gift that God had given him for the building up of the church. Paul opens his first letter to Timothy by urging him to remember his charge. The aim of which is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Paul goes on to say in chapter 1, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them, those prophecies, you may wage the good warfare. By that calling that God has given to you, you would wage warfare. 1 Timothy 4, 14, Do not neglect the gift you have which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. We're going to lay our hands on you tonight, signifying our approval and the approval of this congregation. You to remember that, Rex. I didn't call myself into this. God has called me. 2 Timothy 1.6, for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. 2 Timothy 1.13, follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Timothy was often to think, I have a calling. I have a charge. I have a stewardship given me. I have been enlisted in Christ's service. I have been called by God to do this. And the reality of this calling was to motivate him and animate him in all his work. It was to be a resource to him for his aid. He was to think often, God has called me to this. God has called me to this. I didn't press myself into this office. God has appointed me for this work. And Rex, that was meant to stabilize him. And it is meant also to stabilize you. Rex, your calling, remember, has been given you by God. It has been confirmed by the elders of this church and by this congregation. And that should be a source of security for you. You were called into this ministry by God and by his people. And you will find this many times to be a support to you in the ministry. Rex, I don't know that I would be able to tell you uh, in the kind of personal ways God has brought this to my own remembrance. And God has helped me to persevere in the ministry. To remember, I didn't call myself here. God called me into this work. This congregation called me into this work. You'll need to remember that on many days in your ministry when you feel like an inadequate pastor. The second resource you have, Rex, I want to highlight is that you have the promise of Christ's help and support. As Paul urged Timothy to work hard in the ministry and to persevere amid challenges, he reminded him of this. He said, Timothy, remember Christ Jesus risen from the dead of the seed of David as preached in my gospel. He wanted Timothy to call to mind Christ Jesus, the risen Christ, the King Christ, the Son of David, for his stability and his strength in the ministry. It's striking to go through Paul's writings and to appreciate how much he felt his own need for Christ's help, and how often he experienced that help from Christ in the most profound and wonderful ways. He says in 1 Timothy 1.12, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus my Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Paul knew something of the need for strength, not his own. And he knew what it was like to experience the supply of strength that comes from Christ. He had confidence, the Lord will stand with me. He will strengthen me for this work. And so it is not without great personal experience of that strength that Paul urges Timothy, and he would urge us, Rex, 2 Timothy 2, 1, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Remember, Rex, these are Christ's sheep. And he has tied his own glory and his own eternal pleasure to their well-being. He wants to help you to do your work well. And he will help you in supplying grace, in giving you his spirit, 
in setting for you an example himself in how to care for the flock, in teaching and instructing you in your own walk with him, in interceding for you. Christ will help you, Rex, as you seek to care for his flock. Remember Christ Jesus risen from the dead. And then the third resource for your aid is that you have the assurance that you will be effective. You have the assurance that you will be effective. For the sake of time, I can't open this point up at length. So let me just say this. What I don't mean, Rex, is that every sermon you preach and every pastoral engagement and every decision you make on behalf of this church will be effective and will satisfy all your notions of success. However, we do have the promises of God's word that our ministry will fulfill the ends for which God has given it. He has promised that his word will not return to him void. He has given us to his people for a purpose and by his help, we will fulfill that purpose in their lives. We are the means to his ends. And therefore, he will undertake to make the means successful. Rex, brother, we will succeed in our work, God being our helper. A fourth word to you and most briefly. I've spoken to you of the origin of your call, the nature of your task, the resources for your aid, and finally, Rex, the reward for your labors. Listen to what Peter says to the elders in Asia Minor. I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And here's the reward. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. There are some Christians who seem to think it is inappropriate or somehow unspiritual, to think about the rewards that God promises to his people for faithful service. I think that is entirely wrong. We're meant to think all the time about the rewards that are offered up to his faithful people, recognizing that it's never by our merits that we receive these rewards, but yet recognizing reward is held out to God's people. And Rex, reward is held out to you. There is who knows how long if Jesus tarries, you may be an elder in this church for 30 years, 35 years, 40 years. You may go and plant a church, revitalize a church. We don't know. But if you are faithful to this charge, faithful to this task, if by the grace of God and the help and support of his people, you are enabled to persevere unto the end a faithful shepherd, there is for you the unfading crown of life. You will stand before the chief shepherd. And on that day, you will return his flock to his care. It was only ever a temporary charge, Rex. You will appear before him. And his promise is to you that after years of faithful service and caring for his people, there is a crown for you. A crown that will not fade. An eternal reward. And it is not inappropriate. It's not unspiritual. It's not wrong to look to that reward, to his commendation when we stand before him. My final word, Rex, is to you as a preacher. Uh, Not all pastors are preachers. The Bible says some among the pastorate will be preachers, those who labor in preaching and teaching. I conclude with a charge that has been given to who knows how many thousands of ministers over the years And Rex, I think this charge is specially yours, particularly as a man who has been tasked in a special way with preaching and public ministry. This congregation has communicated to us that they would like you to preach the word here, that you would be part of the regular public ministry of this congregation. And so, Rex, I give you these words tonight in closing from 2 Timothy 4. Jeffrey Rex Blackburn, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort 
with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and they will wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we pray that every grace that is needed, uh, every influence of your spirit that is needed to keep this congregation and to keep our brother Rex, would you please supply it in abundance? Lord, give to our brother and to the other elders of this church grace for this task. Help us in our ministry here. Help our brother Rex. We pray, Lord, that you would prepare him and fit him for this work. We pray that you would preserve him in it. We pray that by your grace and for your glory and for the good of your flock, you would help him to persevere, that you would help him to be sustained in this work and to be fruitful in this work. Lord, you have promised to give your people faithful shepherds. You have promised that these shepherds would be shepherds after your own heart. You have promised that these shepherds would feed your flock on knowledge and understanding. Lord, do this and give this to us in the ministry of our brother Rex. Use him among us in this way for these purposes of your own new covenant to sanctify your people and feed your people and care for your people and support your people. We are looking to you tonight to supply all the grace needed to make our brother faithful in this charge. May you help us to support him and to pray for him and to love him and to work to support him in this work. We pray together in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and let's sing.
Amen. You may be seated. We come now for the heart of this service tonight, and that is for Rex to make his uh, vows publicly, the presence of God, the officers of this church, and our congregation gathered here tonight. Rex, I invite you to come. If you would stand just over here, brother. There's a series of vows that Rex will make, and then vows that we as a congregation will make. Rex, I ask you, do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and practice? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the doctrinal standards of Emmanuel Church for all church officers as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures? Do you pledge fidelity to the covenant and constitution of Emmanuel Church? Rex, do you resolve to be zealous and faithful in maintaining the truths of the gospel and the purity and peace of the church, whatever persecution or opposition may arise unto you on that account? Do you resolve to be faithful and diligent in the exercise of all private and personal duties which become you as a Christian and as a minister of the gospel, as well as in all the duties of your office, endeavoring to adorn the profession of the gospel by your life and walking with exemplary piety before the flock over which God shall make you an overseer. Rex, are you now willing to take the charge of this congregation? And are you resolved to devote your life as an under-shepherd of Christ to the care of his flock gathered in Emmanuel Church? I'd like to ask now that the members of Emmanuel Church please stand. I'm going to ask a series of questions to brothers and sisters we could answer in the plural we do. Do you, the members of Emmanuel Church, continue to profess your readiness to receive Rex Blackburn, whom you have called to be your pastor? Yes. We do. Do you promise to receive the word of truth from him with readiness and humility? and to receive his pastoral care and leadership with meekness and love? We do. Do you promise to encourage him in his labors and to assist him in his endeavors for your instruction and spiritual edification? We do. And do you promise to love, pray for, and support him to the best of your ability that he may carry on a faithful and fruitful ministry among us? We do. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, this time, I'd like to invite my brother pastors to come and to join us. Rex, if you would stand in the middle here. Pastor Ben and Pastor Brad and Mike are going to lead us in prayer as we lay hands on our brother Rex. In the laying on of hands, this is in keeping with the Christian tradition for centuries. It doesn't communicate the passing of any mystical power into our brother Rex. We have no authority to speak ex cathedra or to pass some kind of special blessing on our brother. But this is symbolic of the call that God has placed on his life. The call that, of course, I think originated in the promise of God and in his sovereign will. And the call that has been affirmed by the elders of this church who have worked for Rex's training over the past seven years. And has been expressed through congregational suffrage by the support and vote of this congregation to have Rex serve as one of their elders. And so with that said, we'll lay hands on our brother and Ben if you would begin us in your prayer. Father, we thank you for the gift of Rex to this church. We thank you for calling him out of the world, for giving him to this place. We thank you for making him a man who loves Christ. And he evidences that in his speech, in his conduct, in his love for his wife, for his children, in his love for this church, in his love for people who do not know you. Lord, we ask that you would please continue to bless him as a man of God. We ask that you would help him to walk closely with Christ, that he would keep short accounts of his own conscience, and that he would be careful in his own mind and his heart what he allows into his mind, what he allows to take residence there. We ask that you would help him to be a watchful man, help him to be careful, please help him to be a diligent to study your word, to make application of your word to his own life. Help him to better learn what it looks like to follow Christ. Mm. And that he might, through that education, be an example to us and be a minute faithful minister of God's grace to others. Lord, we ask that you would keep Rex, that you would protect him. We pray for his spiritual health that he would grow, and that he would grow in wisdom. 
we pray for your hand to rest upon him in a particular way that is noted by us in this church. Lord, that we would receive blessing through him because of his faithfulness to Christ. Lord, uh, we pray that you would help him to love Jesus more. That his love for Jesus would be compulsive. That it would be controlling. That it would cause him to do things which are quite unnatural. That it would cause him uh, to love people at loss to himself. That it would cause him to lay down his life. That it would cause him to hate sin and to find it unappealing. That it would cause him to be one who is attractive. One who is attractive because he looks more and more like the risen Christ. We ask, Lord, that you would make Rex to be someone whom others go to because they see the Lord Jesus in him. Lord, we ask that you would help Rex to be a humble man. That he would never become arrogant. But that he would always be humble. Lord, that we ask that you would help Rex to be a gentle man. That his commitment to love others would be uh, followed with gentleness. That he would be effective in his speech to others. Lord, we pray that he would be a man that truly walks after your own heart. And loves the things that you love. And hates the things that you hate. Lord, we pray for him. We ask that you would bless him richly. And that you would use him to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have promised and you have brought to fulfillment this night your promise to raise up shepherds to shepherd your people. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that in Rex that promise is fulfilled. And Lord, we are grateful that you are doing that here and in other, in, and in other places, Lord. You are demonstrating your faithfulness to that promise of yours. Lord, we know that your word says in Jeremiah, I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Lord, we pray that you would help our brother to feed the flock with knowledge and understanding, that he himself would have knowledge and understanding, and not just intellectual or cognitive knowledge and understanding, but the knowledge and the wisdom that come with the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gifting of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we pray that his knowledge and understanding would be replete with love for the people of God. We pray that as he communicates from the pulpit, as he communicates in interpersonal ministry, that it would be born out of a spirit within him that loves Christ supremely that is in fellowship with Christ. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would indeed cause him to keep short accounts, that he, Lord, in the study, would be communing with the Lord Christ. We pray that you would give him supernatural wisdom that he may minister to the people of God. And Lord, we think of that portion for the people of God. We want the people of God to be edified in this place because we know that that is the heart of the true shepherd, the chief shepherd who will appear. You want what is good for your people. And we pray that your people would be edified and blessed. Lord, we think of the tangible ways that Timothy was instructed, Lord, to minister to other people. There is so much interpersonal aspect to ministry, help him to know the flock of God, help him to know each and every one and to see everyone who is in the flock of God, help him to be mindful, help him to be thoughtful and considerate and careful. Lord, we know that your servant Paul was even asking for things like a cloak and parchments 
These are individual things that our brother needs wisdom and grace to do. Help him to see those needs and minister to people. Lord, we also see that Paul instructed Timothy to be able to minister to people by intervening when there were disputes and quarrels among people. He needs that kind of discretion. He needs that kind of wisdom. He needs that kind of grace. Give him, O Lord, all of these things. Make him a personal man, an interpersonal minister of the Lord in his goodness to the people of God. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I want to ask that you would continue to bless our brother Rex in his household and his role and his calling before your face as both a husband and a father. Lord, you, through your servant Paul, told Timothy that uh, an overseer is called to manage his household well. For if he cannot manage his own household, how will he manage the household of God? We want to bless you that you gifted Rex and enabled him to uh, love his wife and lead her well as a husband. That he's proven himself to be a faithful husband and a faithful father to his boys. We pray that you would help him to maintain those qualifications to maintain his love for his wife. Lord, that you would give him the heart of Christ for his church. That Rex would love and lay down his life for Michelle like Christ did for the church. That as Christ washes the church with the water of his word, so that he might present herself to him in splendor. Lord, we pray that Rex would do that to Michelle as well. That she would be made more godly uh, through the word being ministered to her through her own husband as he seeks to disciple and to encourage her in the faith. Lord, I pray that he would strengthen her, help her, support her, encourage her, challenge her. Oh, Lord, pray that you would bless them in their marriage. We pray for Rex as a father. Oh, Lord, that you would bless him as he ministers to his boys, that chiefly he would display the gospel to them, that he would communicate the gospel, that he would be quick to speak of the great love and mercy and goodness of Christ to sinners. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would give his boys the gift of faith at a younger age. Oh, be pleased. You've called Rex to sow, uh, to be a laborer in your harvest. Oh, we pray, we ask, we plead with you, Father, sovereign king of the universe, that you would uh, give him the gift and the joy of reaping a harvest in his own home, that each of his children would follow you by faith. Lord, we pray that our brother's marriage and his role as a father would be exemplary to us, that it would uh, challenge, shape us as a church family. Lord, that he would help us to be more faithful as husbands, as fathers. Oh, Lord, please help him to set an example for the believers in these ways. Lord, thank you for uh, the gift that you've given us and our brother. And that is only true because all that is reflected in him that is good is a mere reflection of you and your grace the way you have loved us, the way you've shepherded and cared for us. Lord, we bless you for that. Uh, Please give us more good examples until we see you face to face. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. 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 Brothers, if you would please remain here. In a moment, we're going to